thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Will. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've never been to Austin before, and uh, in my uh, just three hours in this city, I have already experienced a bit of that uh, Austin hospitality for which the city is so well known. Um, it is also uh, uh, not only a pleasure, but, a, uh, but appropriate to be doing this under the auspices partially of the Strauss Center for, um, if you look in, in Bob Strauss's bio, um, you'll see it in very small print, um, probably with an asterisk after his name, but for, for a brief moment, he was the president's special Middle East envoy. And so there is a, uh, there is a connection and an appropriateness to all of that. Um, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, what I've titled Second Chance, um, uh, President Obama's Middle East peacemaking in the second um, administration. Um, uh, second Chance, of course, implies that, uh, that there needs to be some reconsideration, that the administration is giving some rethink to where it's come from and where it's going in terms of Middle East policy. And I think that's the case. So um, right away, let me offer that hypothesis, that there is indeed a rethink, um, that there is indeed a uh, somewhat different approach on certain very important aspects of the administration's policy toward the Middle East. Now, much of this is occasioned by, um, as the famous saying goes, events. The Middle East of 2013 is a very different place than the Middle East of 2009, uh, when President Obama first took office. And so it, it is really incumbent upon all of us to step back for a minute and, uh, and take a measure of the context, because the context really matters a lot. I'd like to underscore five different uh, trends, five different themes about the context of the Middle East that we see today. It's not a happy picture. First, two mega trends. Uh, the mega trend of Sunni extremism combined with the mega trend of Shi extremism. These are the two dominant political trends in the Middle East today. And they each have various forms. They each operate under different national um, identities. They each have different, um, uh, different hues and shades. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda is very different than the Muslim Brotherhood, which is very different than the Salafi movement in, um, in Tunisia and Egypt. But there can be no dispute that if you look at the Middle East today, and you separate and you, and you compare this from the Middle East a decade ago or two decades ago, um, uh, the spread and the dominance of uh, um, Sunni Islamist extremism on one side and a claim for political power, a claim for political hegemony in some respects by Iran and its partners these two themes dominate the Middle East landscape today. In one arena, and in only one arena, um, these two themes actually work together, which is a, um, a sub-theme, um, uh, and that arena is vis-a-vis -vis Israel. If you were to look, for example, at the Gaza crisis of last year, you saw that um, uh, politically um, Hamas received support from um, Islamist regimes, Sunni Islamist regimes, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood regime in Egypt, um, uh, the Qataris, the Turks, um, and then militarily they received support from the Shi side of this, the Iranians, only government to provide military support to Hamas. Um, uh, it is an exception uh, that Israel um, uh, um, unifies, if you, if, if you will, um, these two themes, but it is a reality. The second sort of theme um, is a bit counterintuitive. We all look at the Middle East over the last decade. We hear, we see wars, we see uh, terrorism, we see um, you know all sorts of nastiness. I look at the Middle East over the last forty years, and I see a striking measure of success for American foreign policy. Um, a striking measure of success because the peace process, which is 
first and foremost a diplomatic tool designed by the United States to help achieve a number of objectives. Peace being number one, of course, but peace not being the only one. Peace, uh, the peace process being a diplomatic tool to help mediate America's competing alliances, alliance between, with Israel on the one hand and Saudi Arabia on the other. Uh, um, peace process succeeded beyond our wildest dreams in the last 40 years to end interstate conflict in the Arab-Israeli arena. From 1973 until today, there's been all sorts of nasty things that happen in the Middle East, but one thing that hasn't happened is war, good old-fashioned interstate war between Arab states and Israel. And that's because for, um, uh, um, uh, throughout this period of time, the leaderships of the countries most likely to engage in this war have viewed it as an as a aspect of their national interest to maintain a state of no war, or in the case of Egypt, certainly, a state of peace. And so, between Egypt and Israel, and Syria and Israel, and Jordan and Israel, there has been peace. Again, it didn't solve all the problems in the Middle East. It certainly didn't solve the Palestinian problem, about which I'll say more in just a few minutes. But we should not take for granted the 40 years in which leaderships throughout this arena recognize their interest in peace. In my view, that has come to an end. In my view, the emergence of the Muslim Brotherhood leadership in Egypt and the likely emergence of an Islamist leadership in Syria has, and is on the verge of, in the case of Syria, bringing to power leaderships that do not share that same interest. This doesn't mean they're going to go to war tomorrow because there are all sorts of other things on the national agendas in Egypt and Syria. But it does mean, in my view, that that fundamental interest in the maintenance of peace and why peace is so important to the national development of those two countries, or no war in the case of Syria, is gone. And we're in a new, we're in a new world. And I'll say a bit more about this later on. Third, and connected to that, is the weakening of the state. We don't talk much about states anymore. States are passé. We live in the post-state world where we tend to talk about international organizations and NGOs and, and the 5,000 most important people in the world who go to Davos every year. But states, states matter. We, the United States, we operate best in a world of strong, responsible, accountable nation states. This is the world that we helped devise after World War II. And we're seeing in the Middle East today the potential for the demise of states as we know it. Not all states, to be sure, but some key ones. Obviously, right in front of our eyes is the disintegration of the state of Syria, created after World War II, or during World War II, held together through uh, some pretty, pretty tough measures throughout the last six decades. But a state nonetheless, a state uh, many of whose citizens consider themselves Syrians, first and foremost. But we see that state collapsing. But it's not only Syria. Very interesting. Uh, quotation um, recently from the head of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, in which um, uh, the spiritual head of the Brotherhood, not the political head, um, in which uh, the Supreme Guide is his official title, in which he uh, was quoted saying, I wouldn't care if an Indonesian was the president of Egypt. It doesn't matter. And what was he getting at? He was getting at the idea which is inherent in the ideology ascribed to by the Muslim Brotherhood that the state, as currently constituted, is a target, something to be overcome, that the state is a barrier 
to the eventual creation of something larger. Now, it may be quite theoretical, but I think we're seeing even this play out in the governance of Mohamed Morsi's administration in Egypt. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Mohamed Morsi is the president of the Arab Republic of Egypt. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, he is the representative of the Muslim Brotherhood at the seat of power in Egypt. And these two identities tug at him. And I think if you were to look at the deep indecision on critical national issues, which has characterized Egypt since he came to office last August, this is the main cause. National interest would have demanded him to take important measures to stop the slide into failed state status. They haven't been taken because the interests of the Brotherhood have been paramount, which has been to uh, try to gain a monopoly over national power in the executive, the legislative, and to hollow out the judiciary um, with a goal toward the long-term establishment of this sort of post-national state. So we're seeing the weakening of states. This, is, this has profound implications for the United States. Fourth, the Iran challenge. I haven't even said a word about, about the Iran nuclear challenge. It hovers out there. Um, uh, this, the President Obama is the third president to deal with the Iran nuclear challenge. There's sort of conventional wisdom in Washington that, that this issue will come to its head at some point over the next 12, 18, 24 months. Uh, I think there's a good chance that will happen, though it's not necessarily a, a certainty. Uh, the pace of Iran's nuclear program is controlled only by the, uh, the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei. So he has his foot on the pedal, can accelerate, can slow down as he likes. Um, it is not an issue over which the United States has control, uh, but it is an issue which hovers over everything. Uh, it is an issue that's put in this, uh, stark relief by what's going on in North Korea. Um, the, uh, um, I, my own view is that the urgency of prevention, the urgency of ensuring that the Iranians under no circumstances acquire a nuclear weapons capability is only enhanced when one sees what is going on on the Korean Peninsula today. And the last of the sort of five big trends that I would point to has to do with the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. The question today in the Israeli-Palestinian relationship really isn't how to move forward. It is how to prevent moving backward. Now, one can prevent moving backward by ensuring that there's diplomacy and that there's forward movement. But we should not be fooled into thinking that the opportunities for her historic resolution of this crisis are ripe, ready, and apparent. But what is ripe, ready, and apparent is the potential collapse of the Palestinian Authority as an institution and the political empowerment of Hamas in the West Bank, matching what was achieved in Gaza several years ago. This is uh, this would be a calamitous situation for Palestinians first and foremost, but also for Israel, for Jordan, and for larger U.S. interests. So this is the environment in which President Obama begins his second term. It is a very, very different context than 2009. Then President Obama decided when he came to office that his first order of business was to be the anti-Bush. Just as George W. Bush, when he came to office in 2001, uh, decided that his first order of business in, uh, in the Middle East was to be the anti-Clinton. George W. Bush being the anti-Clinton was, was quite simple because peace process diplomacy, which President Clinton had invested so much in his last year, collapsed spectacularly. Not for the lack of effort on the part of the president. Indeed, he, uh, he was above and beyond in trying to inject 
real solutions, practical, middle ground, rational solutions. But it wasn't to happen. And as uh, President Clinton uh, says to anybody who asks him, um, you know, Arafat turned him into a failure. President Bush inherited this and took it into a different direction, not least because he came to office just as the Israelis were electing a new leadership as well, uh, Ariel Sharon replacing Ehud Barak, and there was a completely different approach. Um, uh, and over the course of his first term, he, inje he injected a new approach to Arab-Israeli peacemaking, uh, requiring leadership change among the Palestinians uh, and a democratic Palestinian administration. And then that blossomed into the freedom agenda, which was, of course, his uh, hallmark contribution, um, paralleling what he tried to do, at least was the approach, in, uh, in Iraq. Um, President Obama's 2009 anti-Bush uh, beginning of his administration had a, had a different tack. Um, he tried to uh, s uh, reset America's relations with Arabs and Muslims. This was the thrust of his uh, June 2009 trip to, uh, to Cairo, to Riyadh, and to Ankara, his delivery of the great address to the Muslim world in Cairo. Um, a very different approach than what uh, Brett, President Bush had. And also on Middle East peacemaking. If President Bush inherited what he viewed as a spectacular collapse of the peace process from President Clinton, President Obama inherited what was viewed by the Obama team as disinterest and disengagement um, of the, by the Bush team. And so he, on the second day of his administration, appointed a special Middle East envoy, George Mitchell promised engagement, promised activism, um, and promised that on his watch there would be a major push for Arab-Israeli reconciliation. It didn't happen. Uh, again, not for lack of effort. Um, um, I think partially for, um, uh, for tactical errors the United States made, uh, but more importantly because uh, the parties then, and even more so today, uh, remain quite far apart on core issues. Um, uh, uh, when you look back on the past four years, it is striking to note that despite the promise that President Obama made on the second day of his administration, uh, the result has been just two weeks of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations in the past four and a half years. Indeed, there has been less Arab, uh, Israeli-Palestinian diplomacy less Israeli-Palestinian negotiation, less Arab-Israeli engagement in the last four years than in any administration since, appropriately enough, Lyndon Johnson. Um, it is, uh, um, it's, it's a remarkable and striking and worrisome feature of this Middle East that I just described, how little Arab-Israeli engagement has gone on and I would say even behind closed doors. You know, usually we like to, uh, you know, as Middle East aficionados say that privately Arabs and Israelis are working out all sorts of things. The reality is there's much less of that. It goes on, to be sure, but much, much less of that in the last four years than in the previous 16 years, to be quite bipartisan about it. Um, the other piece of President Obama's uh, uh, approach in 2009 was strategic disengagement, that America was overcommitted in the Middle East, and that we needed to disengage ourselves and convince Middle Easterners that we and they are better off with a lower American profile. Getting out of the war in Iraq is, of course, the most obvious but it's not the only aspect of this. And indeed, if you look at uh, President Obama's approach to the Syria issue, and I'll say more about this in a minute, if you look at President Obama's approach to the Syria conflict, there is a deep and profound reluctance, not at all born of you know, disinterest in the humanitarian issues, not at all born of ignorance of the strategic stakes, because 
That's just not the case. I think President Obama realizes, just as all of his senior advisors realize, that change in Syria would be an enormous positive cutting the link between Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah, transforming the regional calculus in a very positive way. But what Ameri in his view, what America could do, the costs of, of that would far, far outweigh the benefits. And our, in his view, our um, uh, uh, unique marginal contribution to change would be too costly. This, this, this has been an approach in the last four years of what I called a moment ago strategic disengagement. Now, regrettably, many in the, in the Middle East have viewed this as disinterest and a lack of leadership. And it's tough getting away from that reality. Um, uh, that indeed colors how Middle Easterners of all stripes view this approach by the president. Today, we're four years later. Everybody in this administration is much more sober about the Middle East than they were four years ago. The reset with Arabs and Muslims, I don't want to go so far as to say it failed, but it fizzled. It became irrelevant. Um, if indeed part of the goal was to improve America's standing in the Middle East, uh, if indeed poll, ma poll numbers matter, my own view is that they don't, but for many people in this, and not this, only this administration, poll numbers do matter. If indeed they do matter, uh, America's standing is as low, if not lower, than it was in many points of the Bush administration. Um, we did succeed in ending our military engagement in Iraq, but as I said a moment ago, the cost was an, a, a common sense, a common view in capital after capital in the Middle East that America was leaving, that America was disinterested, that the pivot to Asia was closing the door on America's continued involvement in the Middle East. Um, this, this theme gets accelerated by what for us is unvarnished good news. The emergence of America as um, a, a near energy self-sufficient country. And for us, you know, th this, is, this is something Americans have, um, have hoped for, for for decades. In the Middle East, the implications of this are just beginning to set in. And Middle Easterners are asking all sorts of questions. Will America remain as committed to the defense of the Gulf when it no longer relies upon the Gulf as a source of energy? What will our relationship be when it is other countries, the Europeans, the Chinese, who benefit from our defense of the Gulf? Surely we don't want the Chinese to be the defenders of the Gulf. Surely the Saudis would not trade their security relationship with the United States for a security relationship with China. But what do we want? And Middle Easterners don't really yet know the answer to that question. And frankly, I don't think that we've had that national conversation yet. The, uh, the profound strategic change of energy self-sufficiency is so new. So. What is the administration doing new, faced with this profound new change, this profound set of changes occasioned by what is called the Arab Spring, a term that is about as big a misnomer as one can come up with in, uh, in politics. Um, everybody who's been to the Middle East knows that there's no spring in Egypt. Egypt has two seasons, winter and summer. Plus, I never really quite, quite understood People don't, don't remember the historical, uh, the historical antecedent. The Prague Spring, the Prague Spring ended horribly. The Prague Spring ended with Soviet tanks coming into the streets of Prague and destroying the, um, you know, the budding democratic movement. I never quite understood the, um, the appeal of the term Arab Spring. It's wrong on so many grounds, um, uh, not just the historical analogy, the Arab Spring suggests 
that there's an Arab uniform Arab component, that, it, that what applied in one Arab country applies to other Arab countries. This is the exact opposite. What has occurred in the last three years in the Middle East is a series of national experiences. What happened in Egypt was by Egypt. What happened in Yemen was by Yemen. Even what's happening in Syria is overwhelmingly by Syrians. To call it an Arab something doesn't do justice to the national identities of the people engaged in each and one of these different and, and, and quite kaleidoscopic enterprises. The level of violence, the political objectives, the roles of the different players differ in each place. There is a term that I use um, which uh, has begun to catch on in certain places because I think there is a Middle Eastern term that, um, that we all know. Um, we've used it in a different context which is very appropriate for what's gone on in these transitional countries over the last two plus years. And it's a term that we know from the Israeli-Palestinian context. And it's a term, term that in Arabic means throwing off. Um, uh, a political change, sometimes violent, sometimes not, the outcome of which is decidedly uncertain. Anybody know what that word is? Intifada, intifadat. Um, and so I call these uprisings, which is the common English term for uh, intifada. Um, I think we've had a series of uprisings in Arab countries, the outcome of which is still decidedly uncertain. But how has the administration recalibrated its, uh, its approach now that President Obama has won re-election? Well, we can see some areas of change. The most visible is the reset with Israel, uh, made most obvious by the president's trip there last month. Um, president Obama decided that it was important to have a reset of relations with the people and government of Israel. Uh, and here he was trying to repair what, were, what was viewed as a set of self-inflicted mistakes. Um, by his administration in the first year in 2009. Uh, an overemphasis on settlement activity as the path through which um, um, all peace process diplomacy had to pass, um, a personalization, uh, Bibi and Obama personalizing their differences and having a very sour leader-to-leader um, uh, -leader relationship, um, uh, uh, lack of confidence, um, projected by mixed messaging on uh, the U.S. understanding of and approach to the Iran nuclear challenge. I think the president uh, made a decision that at some point over the next year, 18 months or so, there's going to be what we euphemistically call an Iran contingency. This could be a military crisis with Iran, or it could be a diplomatic crisis about Iran. It could be that the United States and Iran reach a nuclear bargain that many in Israel and elsewhere will view as a bad deal. Or it could be the point has been reached for, um, uh, for decisions about military action against Iran's nuclear crisis. And in either of these circumstances, it was important, I believe, for the president to have credit in the bank from the people in leadership in Israel that he was approaching this set of issues with their best interests and America's best interests aligned. And that, I think, went to the heart of why he went to Israel and really bent over backwards to repair um, relationships. As I said, not just with the government, but with the people. You know, there's also, I think, uh, people ask me about the Netanyahu-Obama relationship. And we can go into this in questions if you'd like. But um, in my, uh, my experience in Washington, there's a grudging respect that political leaders have for re-elected democratic leaders. It's one thing to get elected once. It's another thing to get elected twice. And I think both the president and the prime minister, after their unhappy experiences with each other, not just um, throughout the first term, but in each other's elections, 
um, the fact that each of them came out on top sort of clears the decks. And there's, there's, a, there's a grudging but healthy respect that each of them has for each other that they each succeeded in getting reelected. And I think their relationship is now off on better terms. I won't say excellent, but better terms. There's a second aspect connected to this, um, which is an important strategic desideratum, which is repairing Israel-Turkish relations. Um, and the president has tried to do this in the past, but I think it was viewed, especially in the Syria context, of, of major importance that the United States at least begin the visible process of repairing these relations. I say visible because behind the scenes, there are all sorts of things that continue to go on between Israel and Turkey, especially in areas of trade. But the visible breach undercut America's influence in the region. America suffers when its two leading regional allies are at loggerheads. This undercuts our ability to assert our influence. And so the president did something really quite, quite impressive. Um, in my view, he took occasion of the overreach by the prime minister of Turkey when um, uh, Erdogan not only insulted the government of Israel, but insulted uh, its ideology by claiming that Zionism was a crime against humanity. And President Obama made the decision to go to Herzl's grave Herzl being the founder of modern Zionism, which was not only a, a message to the people of Israel about what President Obama understands about Israel's national origins, but it was a profound poke in the eye to Erdogan. And the idea that the president could do that, in my view, gave Netanyahu the cover to make the apology that he then made to Erdogan, which was well scripted, well choreographed, word for word had been worked out between the Israelis and the Turks, but I think that the, I think President Obama created the moment. And that, this is very important to create the context for re-engaging between Israelis and Turks. Third, an important American effort on the peace process. John Kerry there now for the third time in just six weeks as Secretary of State. Again, the point here Behind, beyond all the rhetoric that you might hear from Secretary Kerry, the point here is to prevent backward motion, is really to prevent actively with the, with, with the Secretary deeply engaged, to prevent the collapse of the Palestinian Authority, to provide not just economic change, economic advantage, but also a political context. Um, I don't think anybody has illusions about the prospects for, for diplomatic breakthrough. This new Israeli government did not come to power based on the peace process. Um, this new Israeli cabinet um, really has a domestic agenda. Um, but everybody, Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, moderate Arabs, certainly the United States, recognizes the urgency of ensuring that the PA doesn't collapse. And lest anybody remember, uh, forget rather, um, uh, last year was the first year in memory that not a single Israeli died as a result of terrorism emanating from the West Bank. There are many reasons for this. Um, I'd say Israeli-Palestinian security cooperation is a key aspect of it. Certainly the importance of the, the security barrier. Certainly IDF operations. But Everything plays a role, and Israeli-Palestinian security cooperation, if that collapses, then this, this fabric of calm collapses too. So we're seeing re-engagement, building confidence in preparation for a possible Iran contingency. We're seeing some strategic rethink and an effort to make sure that the Israelis and Turks are on the same page vis-a-vis -vis Syria, which is their common challenge. This is all, I would say, very good and very positive and reflects a more sober approach to the Middle East. There are two areas, however, where a rethink is still unclear. One is Syria itself. 
Um, in January, the president gave an interview to the New Republic. I commend you to see this because it has at least one remarkable statement in it about, the, um, about Syria, uh, where the president says, um, uh, you know, we should, I'm paraphrasing here, um, we shouldn't rush into a decision about engaging, about America's intervention, about a role that we can play in this. And that concept, rushing in, I think that says a lot. Because after all, this is two years after the start of the Syria conflict. Um, this isn't rushing in. You know, compare the Syria conflict from Libya, uh, where we made decisions about our engagement in a matter of days. Um, I think that reflects, I think that, that image about want, not wanting to rush in represent, uh, reflects the deep, deep reluctance that the president has toward this. My own view is this is a mistake. Um, I have a paper trail on this, so uh, this isn't, uh, um, this isn't uh, you know, just gilding the lily. Um, I, I, I said oh, 18 months ago in congressional testimony, the options in Syria are not between good and bad, they're between bad and worse. The worse grows more likely every day. Um, decision making is not about between choosing between good and bad, that's easy. We pay, the, we pay them the big bucks to uh, choose between bad and worse. And our, in my view, our leaders are responsible for trying to bring about the least bad options for American interests. In my view, uh, Syria, with every passing day, grows more likely to become a jihadist state, um, which would be a catastrophe for all that we care about in this part of the world. And I think that with, now the price is rising for our engagement, but, uh, um, but it is still not anywhere near what the price, you know, pe pe people have this image, American engagement equals the 82nd Airborne. Um, intervention has gotten a bad name because of what happened in Iraq, that it's a black and white issue. Uh, intervene means send in the Marines. That's not what intervene means. Engagement can mean everything from, from communications, supply, training, military hardware, all sorts of things without ever setting foot on Syrian territory. And uh, so I regret very much that we did not play this role earlier on, at very least to convince the Russians that there was a cost for their support of Assad. And if we had um, uh, uh, convinced the Russians of that much earlier on, then I think the tide of battle would have changed at a much faster pace than it already does seem to be changing. So there's a big question mark I would say that we're probably likely to back into engagement in Syria in the worst possible way. Um, we're likely to get engaged because uh, of um, our partners in the region are going to beg for it. The Jordanians are swimming in refugees. Um, some, uh, pretty soon they're going to approach 10% of their population. Just imagine that for a moment, sort of the equivalent of 30 plus million um, foreign refugees coming into the United States in just 18 months. That's huge. And we're a rich country. The Jordanians have been in red ink since they were founded in 1921. Uh, they can't afford it. They can't sustain it. Um, the Turks are going to ask for it, the Jordanians. I think we're going to back into engagement in Syria, and, uh, which is not the way you want to get engaged in the world's deadliest conflict today. Egypt is another area where there's a big question mark. Um, uh, the Egyptians believe that the United States, or across the board, Egyptians, if you ask them, um, they believe a canard. They believe that the United States uh, wanted to bring the Muslim Brotherhood to power. I've been in Egypt several times since the revolution, and I'm continually amazed how many Egyptians believe this. Um, but it, it is an extraordinarily widespread and common view that the United States not only supports the Muslim Brotherhood, but help arrange their ascent to power. Um, why do they believe it? They believe it because the United States, again, regrettably in my view, has been reluctant to engage. I think we did an enormously good job 
right around the transfer of power from Mubarak to, uh, to the SCAF in 2011. I'm happy to go into this if you'd like. But then I think we dropped the ball. And we dropped the ball in such a way that the people who picked it up were the Muslim Brotherhood. Not by, not by design by Washington, but because that's the way the ball bounced. And the result is, today, um, Egyptians believe that the only thing the United States cares about is something very important, but not the only thing in Egypt. And that is Egypt's maintenance of its peace with Israel. And as long as there isn't shooting across the border between Egypt and Israel, the United States will give Morsi a pass. That is the commonly held view across the Egyptian political spectrum. And it is very dangerous because Egypt is soon to become a failed state because of the indecision and the poor leadership of Mohamed Morsi, about which we have done very little to change his thinking. So Egypt and Syria drifting in the wrong direction, big question mark about where, whether we're having a new approach, whether there's a second chance that we're taking. The, the, last, the last remains the same um, issue on which President Obama uh, focused from the first day of his administration, really, which is Iran. Um, and here, the test will come. There's, not, there's no need for a second chance because we haven't failed the first chance yet. The president has done very good at organizing an international coalition on sanctions. Sanctions, by all accounts, are stronger today than anybody could possibly have imagined. That's the good news. The bad news is they've had absolutely no impact on the pace of the Iranian nuclear program. And so these two facts run in parallel. Sanctions, powerful, strong, tightening, use the adjective. The nuclear program progressing unabated. So we will see. We will see if these two lines meet. My own view on this is sort of as follows. Uh, President Obama might decide to invest the energies of the White House and his Secretary of State in trying to bring about Arab-Israeli peace, but if he fails, so be it. He will be the sixth president to have tried and failed. If, however, on his watch, Iran achieves a nuclear weapon, that will be his epitaph. That will be on his political tombstone. I promised it wouldn't happen, and it did. I don't think it can happen on his watch. So I am, in fact, bullish that if it comes to that, the United States will use military force to prevent Iran from achieving a nuclear weapons capability. The question is if Iran is going to challenge that or whether it continues its foot on the accelerator just enough to increase its capabilities without crossing into the zone which triggers American or Israeli action. Are they smart enough? Are they cagey enough? Or are they risky enough? Let's remember this is the regime that tried to kill the ambassador of Saudi Arabia just six blocks from the White House. Rational, irrational, I don't use these terms, but this is the regime that tried to do that. But even more importantly, it's also the regime that it knows when it tried to do that, there was no American reaction. So what lesson do they take away from this? That you can try these sorts of gambits and get away with it, or that it is silly and self-defeating to try them at all? I don't know. My own colleagues, and I'll close on this note, my own colleagues at the Washington Institute who follow this much more closely than I do, they believe the leadership of Iran is so paranoid, so worried, that American strategy is designed to eviscerate the Islamic Republic, that it is out for regime change, which in fact it isn't. But they believe it so much that if, a, if the United States offered the Iranians unconditional surrender, the Iranians would still say no, fearing that there's a poison pill in there somewhere. 
This is the leadership of Iran. And this ultimately, I think, will determine President Obama's epitaph in the broader Middle East. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it's a very good question. Actually, I, I wrote down a little note here earlier that I sort of skipped over in my talk that a big question mark about the, the third big question mark, if there's Egypt, there's Syria, I would say the third big question mark facing the administration is how does it approach the prospect of political change in the monarchies and Saudi Arabia being the most uh, important and pivotal of them. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting that uh, what is the only Arab country that President Obama has visited since the onset of the Arab Spring? Anybody know? Jordan, a monarchy. So with all these changed countries, countries in democratic transition, um, he went to Jordan. Now, there are reasons why he went to Jordan, um, and you know, some of them are quite obvious. But it, it is striking that um, a president who embraced you know, uh, change in the Middle East in 2011 uh, with, with the soaring words of, of Gandhi and King chose to set foot only in an Arab monarchy, not in an Arab republic um, in the years since then. Um, um, and I think, there's, I think that reflects, you know, I don't want to read into this too much, but I think it reflects deep ambivalence about this entire episode of change. Um, and if you follow the line that we are looking for at, at some level, strategic disengagement, um, one implication is we don't want to shake things too much. We don't, we're not eager for too rapid political change in the monarchies because that would only pull us in, pull us in a lot more. Uh, and so we have a, a problem with the Saudis because their leadership you know, rots from the top. I don't mean it in a derogatory sense. I mean, oh, it was tough, I guess, not to use that metaphor in a derogatory <laughs> way. But I, I, I mean, the king of Saudi Arabia is an invalid. Uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia is an invalid. Um, uh, leadership is only now about to begin to pass that, um, that transformation which people have been talking about for decades, namely from the sons of Ibn Saud to the grandsons of Ibn Saud, which opens up a vast reservoir of potential leaders, but it also opens up a vast reservoir of potential sibling rivalry and first cousin and second cousin rivalry. And we don't know what that's going to look like. Um, uh, all sorts of, 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 of problems in Saudi Arabia, population explosion, unemployment, you name it. Saudi, you th now, granted, I'd rather have um, uh, their checkbook balance than my checkbook balance. Um, the king of Saudi Arabia came back from convalescing in Morocco a couple of years ago uh, after seeing all the, what was going on in uh, Egypt and Tunisia and immediately um, promised $100 billion of, uh, um, uh, you know, of goodies to the people of Saudi Arabia. And you know, in Texas, that might not sound like a lot of money. But um, <laughs> in Saudi Arabia, that's, that's still a lot of money. Um, but still, I think the Gulf is going to see some change. Um, and the two most vulnerable places are Bahrain and Kuwait, places which, which do have quaking political uh, environments, um, less so in the UAE and Qatar. But Saudi Arabia is, is a place that, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say it's going to happen tomorrow, but I'd be very surprised if a decade from now Saudi Arabia 
um, looks and feels like the Saudi Arabia um, of today. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, I wish that, like, I, I wish that were the case, but that's not the case. I mean, I, of course, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say, yes, Satloff, you're an idiot. No, but uh, no, I, um, uh, the, the, the United States, look, the, the United States is not directly engaged in the Syrian rebellion. Um, uh, our allies or our sort of certain Arab partners of ours are providing weaponry to certain elements of the Syrian rebellion. Um, but, but regrettably, we're not. We did start to provide some non-lethal support to certain aspects of the Syrian opposition, um, much too late in my view. Um, uh, but, um, you know, what can I say? We'll all read the, uh, the files 10 years from now. But... Um, um, I'll make a healthy wager that, that we're not providing uh, military support. We haven't been providing military support to the Syrian opposition uh, since the start of this rebellion. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Well, it certainly wasn't imminent from the beginning. Um, you know, let's remember how this all started, because uh, it's a gruesome story, but it deserves to be remembered. It, was a, you know, it's, it all started in the, in the Syrian border town of Dara, which is across the Jordanian border, um, when a group of kids wrote some graffiti on a wall. And they were brought in by the Syrian uh, they were, they were They were taken into, you know, intelligence office, um, brutally tortured and killed. And then the, um, uh, the, the head of the local Mukhabarat called in all their parents. And this, this, this is a, a very conservative, long-time pro-regime town where the leadership was always very docile and quiescent. And the sheikhs were all brought in, and uh, the, uh, the local Syrian governor um, uh, said to them, uh, we urge you all to go home and have more children because you do not have any more children. And that's how this started. So it wasn't a, it wasn't, it didn't start as an ethnic thing. It started as a reflection of the brutality, as a, a reaction to the brutality of the Syrian regime. Um, and it started actually as a cross-ethnic effort against the Syrian regime. But it has become much more of an ethnic uh, rebellion. Um, uh, now, certainly, the regime has wanted it to become an ethnic rebellion. Uh, that is in their interest. And it's happened. I don't like it. It's not totally so. But it has certainly taken on that coloration. Now, why do I think that, uh, that the chances of a negative outcome are much greater today? As one of my colleagues, Andrew Tabler, likes to say, the people who will call the shots 
are the people who are taking the shots. It is no longer the case that the nice civic associations and the uh, mainstream middle class people who took to the streets in March, April, May 2011 are the most influential people in Syria today and the Syrian opposition. The most influential people in the Syrian opposition are the ones with the biggest guns, the ones with the most guns. And regrettably, the ones with the biggest and the most guns are the ones who are various shades of Salafi and jihadi groups. Now, will they choose to create a vast coalition should they come to power? Perhaps. We can hope so. But um, uh, if, we, if we accept the basic line that the people who will call the shots are the people who will be taking the shots, then that's what leads me to my negative conclusion about the likely outcome. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, thank you. It's a, it's a good question, and the, the assumption is something I first want to make a comment on. Um, I don't see Morsi as Mehdi Barzagan. Um, um, I do see, however, um, a very important similarity, and here I'll, I'll, uh, um, I'll credit my colleague Mehdi Khalaji, who's a, an Iranian expert, for pointing this out. Um, Khomeini, when he came to power, one of his early goals was to get a constitution through fast. And he telescoped the national conversation in Iran into a very brief period to get the uh, constitution of the Islamic Republic approved because that settled the debate. And that immediately marginalized all of the um, uh, secular, liberal, non-Islamist uh, non members of the coalition that brought about the revolution, because it established the Islamic Republic and Vilayat al faqih In that sense, there's a great similarity in Egypt. Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood's top priority was get the constitution through fast. First through constitutional referendum in March of 2011, but then the real constitution, get it done. And the idea, I mean, we think about this, in 48 hours they negotiated and then 10 days later they approved the constitution of the new Egypt. In that sense, there's a real, there's a real connection, a similarity. Because the idea there was once the constitution is set, then the basis for building the sort of Egypt that we want is done. Now you asked about, um, uh, about the military. It is absolutely true that the military um, uh, is not enamored, in general, enamored with the Muslim Brotherhood. It's absolutely true the military wants to maintain a relationship with the United States. The United States essentially provides the procurement budget for the military. Um, but the balance of power in Egypt has shifted. In February 2011, the United States played a role in helping a transition of power from one octogenarian air force general to one septuagenarian army general. The transfer from Hosni Mubarak to Field Marshal Tantawi and the SCAF. And that was the basic American strategy, that the SCAF, the military, Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, could manage this transition that was the basic strategy. And when that strategy was put in place, we basically began to look elsewhere, focus on other Middle East problems. 
The problem was, and, and it made a lot of sense. These were our partners. We'd worked with them for years. We provided them funding. We knew them. They trained in America. It made a lot of sense. I supported it. I helped. I give, uh, you know, I, I urged it on. This made great sense. And it was an abysmal failure. We bet on the wrong horse. The military proved to be the single most inept political actor in the modern history of the Middle East. And there's a lot of competition for that title. <laughs> the single most inept. In just 16 months, the military, which had total control of Egypt, then made a deal with a very junior partner, the Muslim Brotherhood, to help them with certain things. In 16 months, that junior partner did a coup and took over and totally sidelined the military, chopped off the heads, politically speaking, of Tantawi and the chief of staff. And then Morsi didn't just go to the next in line. My colleague Eric Traeger figured out he went down to number 38 in line to make that person the new Minister of Defense, somebody totally beholden to President Morsi. Um, the new Minister of Defense, Assisi. Now, um, that military is a very different military than the military we thought was going to do this transition. And they have given every, uh, they have projected every um, 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 idea of reluctance to get back into politics. Once in a while they will say if things really collapse, you know, we might have to come back in. But for things to really collapse, their definition of really collapse is a true failed state, which Egypt is not yet. Um, and I think the military would think twice and three times and then again before it goes in. It may, don't get me wrong. Egypt today is really teetering, but we're not, yet, we're not there yet. And, the, and uh, um, the Muslim Brotherhood knows it. And that's what gives them the freedom to continue to pursue their claim for control over all the levers of authority in the country. Uh, in the way back, yes, please. Right. Um, well, I don't want to make too much of them going to Jordan, but my point is really this. Um, fo focus more, for example, on uh, Secretary Kerry's visit to Egypt last month. Um, Secretary Ke Kerry came to Egypt and convinced the Egyptians to accept $150 million. That was, that was basically the goal. And I think this was a major mistake. Because what should the goal in Egypt be right now? The goal should be to change the calculus of President Morsi to act less as the head of the Muslim Brotherhood and more as the president of the state of Egypt. What would be acting like the president of the state of Egypt? It would be implementing the economic reforms necessary to secure an IMF loan. Um, and so uh, um, what would make sense, in my view, for the United States would be to marshal its funds and, um, and the funds of other potential donors as the incentive for Morsi to take the tough measures that a president of the state of Egypt would take. But what message do we send to President Morsi when we come and we go, we leave a check, but it's not connected to the implementation of any um, austerity measures that might merit international financial support. In my view, it totally undermines what our real objectives should be vis-a-vis -vis Egypt. And so this is, this is, I mean, the visit to Jordan was what, what, it, was what it was, but it, it's really, this is really what's getting to the heart of it. It's, um, uh, in my view, we should be trying to make sure that, that the leadership of Egypt acts like the leadership of a state and use the means at our disposal, in this case, Fairly, fairly meager 
U.S. financial assistance. Because $150 million in Egypt today isn't going to go very far, given Egypt's deep financial crisis. But be that as it may, it would be an important signal to all the other donors about what is necessary to merit financial support. And we did not send the signal that real reform is necessary to merit support. Oh, you get a pick now. I get all these, I get everybody who wants to ask a question. There's a gentleman right in front of me, very patient looking. What is your level of optimism that Iraq will settle their problems, getting back to your point, your 21st point, about extreme people who are extreme Shiite, extreme Sunni, that Iraq will settle their issues and become a more stable, governmental, more stable country within the Middle East? Uh, I mean, this is looking into a crystal ball. I do think, I am struck that Iraq has stayed together. I mean, if you go back 10 years, the conventional wisdom was Iraq's breaking up. I mean, Joe Biden actually wrote an op-ed piece, uh, if you want to go into the archives, which urged Iraq to break up, um, or urged that the United States help accelerate the breakup of Iraq. Um, but Iraq has stayed together, unhappily, uneasily. Uh, the, 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 both Maliki and the Kurds could make decisions which tear this country apart, especially how they work out um, the oil arrangements. Um, uh, uh, the Kurds in the north might, be, might, might see um, the breakup of Syria as a prize to link up um, northeastern Syria and northern Iraq, and they might they might smell the whiff of independence, which could crack apart this country. All, the, all that is possible. But I think you cannot but be impressed that with all the problems, Iraq has stayed together. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm grudgingly optimistic. Now, Maliki is not my favorite leader in the world. Um, the Iranians have much too much influence in this country. I think we drew down our influence too quickly. Um, all that, you know, that, that's all secondary to your question, which is, is Iraq going to stay together? And I think that, uh, you know, it's a leap. You, you, you have to make a real leap to say Iraq is about to fall apart now if it didn't fall apart over the last decade. Stop right there. Stop right there. <laughs> You mean the Obama administration? I'm sorry, the Obama yeah. administration. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, I, let's take the example of Iran, they probably haven't influenced any oil since the Mosul decade. Doesn't seem like any more leverage there would be independent from their energy. Uh, or the fact that prices are set on the, on the global market and really our challenge is that prices are what we most want to get to, not look, exclusively. So I, I agree with Look, you. Look, your, um, your analysis is, is exactly correct, um, but that's not what the common perception is. Um, uh, it hasn't hit yet, but I, here I'm willing to wager that there is going to be some American presidential candidate in 2016. Um, uh, and we can probably all throw out our names for which one who that is likely to be, who is going to make the following argument. We fought two wars in the Persian Gulf when oil mattered to us. Why do we have to defend the Persian Gulf when oil doesn't matter to us? 
or energy, you know, fill in the blank. Now, there's an answer to the question, but it's, it's, it, it's not a 30-second soundbite answer. And it's a complicated answer. It's an answer about global prices. It's an answer about our allies' dependence upon Persian Gulf. It's an answer about instability in the region. It's an answer about, about China. But it's not an answer that's a one-sentence answer with one noun and one verb about why this matters to us. And in there is a real, is a real problem. Um, and it will take American leadership from the White House to explain the real answer. Now, if you look at, I don't, this, it's, a, it's sort of a bipartisan thing, although President Obama gets most of the blame for it at the moment. If you look at his explanation or the explanation of his advisors about why we're not engaged in Syria, for example. It, it, the, the, there's all this talk about war, war weariness and reluctance and we're tired and we have to fix our things at home. All of which is true. All of which is true. But it doesn't include the one variable which changes the equation and which has been the key change in, a, in every major American intervention globally for the last hundred years, which is leadership. We didn't want to get into World War I. We didn't want to get into World War II. We didn't want to get into you name it. Overwhelming popular opinion was against engagement in all these conflicts. The key variable that changed it was leadership. So when I hear from the White House, and that's not just this White House, it's all White Houses, about how popular opinion plays in a certain direction, it fails to account for their own ability to change it, which is historically the key variable. And I think that that key variable will play a huge role just on your question. Because unless there's a president, this president or his successor, who makes the activist case for why this is important to us, and it's a complex case, then I think there could be a real parting of the ways between our public opinion which understood engagement for decades, and the leadership in the Middle East who's going to see that we're, we're just drifting in a different direction. And that's where I think leadership is the, is, is the variable that matters the most. I hope that got at your question. Thank you. Thank you very much.